One morning in February of 1220, the residents of the fabled Silk Road city of Bukhara looked out from their battlements to find Chinggis Khan, his younger son Tolui, and a formidable Mongol army camped right in front of the city walls. Chinggis, by the way, is the preferred way of pronouncing the great Khan's name by Mongol specialists today. It is a more accurate rendering of his written name than Genghis. Now, this was hundreds of miles from the last reported sighting of Chinggis, and their unexpected appearance at Bukhara was a testament to the, the stamina of the Mongol army, which had ridden surreptitiously across the harsh Kizilkum Desert, and of course, to the strategic brilliance of its leadership. Atta Malik Juvani, a Persian scholar whose history of the world conqueror will be one of the key eyewitness accounts we rely on to tell our story in this course, had this to say about the reaction of the citizens of Bukhara that fateful morning. When the inhabitants beheld the surrounding countryside choked with horsemen and the air black as night with the dust of cavalry, fright and panic overcame them and fear and dread prevailed. Three years later, another Mongol army under the command of generals Subodai and Jebe surprised a massive Kievan Rus army of 80,000 men on the banks of the Kalka River and despite being greatly outnumbered, utterly destroyed it. This was the culmination of a brief period of devastation unleashed without warning on the peoples of Armenia, Georgia and Russia, but to the Mongols, it was just a sideshow to the main campaign against the Khwarezm Shah. As Subodai and Jebe turned east and headed back to Khwarezmia to continue the war, a Russian chronicler living in the city of Novgorod wrote, the Tatars turned back from the Dnieper River and we know not whence they came nor where they hid themselves again. Only God knows whence he fetched them against us for our sins. A Muslim author and contemporary to all these events, Ibn al-Athir was so overwhelmed by the unexpected devastation caused by the Mongols' Khwarezmian campaign that he lamented, it may well be that the world from now until its end will not experience the like of it again. Hello and welcome to this course on the Mongols and how their conquest of enormous regions of Eurasia changed the course of human history. Early in the 13th century, Mongol armies began to move out from their homeland on the grasslands of Mongolia to eventually conquer all of China, Korea, Central Asia, Persia, the Middle East, Georgia, Armenia, Russia, and much of Eastern Europe, establishing the largest empire ever seen. And yet, as surprising and shocking as their sudden appearance clearly was to those they conquered, the Mongols were just the latest in a long line of militarized pastoral nomads who had been raiding and invading even the most powerful sedentary states of Eurasia for a very long time. We will explore some of these predecessors in detail in Lecture 3, but it's worth mentioning them here. The Xiongnu, Shanbei, the Turks, the Uyghurs, the Khitan, and the Jurchen. Each of these were formidable militarized confederations of highly skilled mounted archers under inspired leadership, and each had a devastating impact on the peoples around them. It was the Chinese who bore the brunt of many of these nomadic incursions, which is why they built a great wall to help protect them. So the Chinese were far less surprised by the appearance of the Mongols than other states further to the west. The Mongols and the Timurids were destined to be the last in this long line. They created the most influential of all the empires of the steppe, empires that acted as a bridge between the medieval world and the early modern one that would follow. Chinggis Khan, who claimed a mandate from heaven to rule the world, was singularly responsible for creating the Mongol Empire. Once Chinggis and his successors had created the vast Mongol Empire, East and West Eurasia were linked together as never before. This made possible the diffusion westwards of all manner of East Asian ideas and technologies that eventually galvanized Europeans to step out of their parochial kingdoms and begin to explore and soon colonize the world around them. It is because of this unifying effect that some historians claim the Mongols as one of the principal architects of the modern world, although certainly not all agree. We will return to this assessment many times in the lectures ahead and try and reach some sort of a conclusion by the end of the course on whether the Mongols deserve this mantle. Despite these many positive effects, we must of course acknowledge that the Mongols were horrendously destructive. They killed millions of people and destroyed dozens of the greatest cities of the ancient world 
along with the agricultural infrastructure that had sustained them for millennia. But we must weigh this against the fact that the Mongols facilitated intensified levels of trade and exchange between East and West, patronized the finest artisans and craftsmen, promoted religious tolerance, and provided sufficient security across Eurasia to allow travelers like Marco Polo to undertake in safety extraordinary journeys from one end of their empire to the other. Although the Mongols distinguished themselves from those they conquered by their formidable military skill, they also enjoyed a more egalitarian social structure than all the sedentary states they interacted with. As with all other nomadic pastoralist confederations, in the Mongol world, decisions were made by a council of political and military elites, including the decision as to who would be elected Great Khan. This meant that although the Khans had great power and prestige, they were still regarded as first amongst equals. Mongol women also enjoyed considerable freedom, respect and influence, particularly when compared to the status of women in most contemporary sedentary societies. There are several examples known to us of Mongol women who gained great political power, and we shall also meet some of these formidable Mongol queens in our course. It was partly because of these more egalitarian social and political structures and the life way of pastoral nomadism itself that the Mongols held a decided military advantage over even the best equipped and trained sedentary armies. These advantages included advanced cavalry tactics and supreme horse riding skills, enhanced mobility and fieldcraft skills, and their extraordinary prowess with a composite bow and arrow. The Mongols were rarely beaten in the field, and uniquely amongst their nomadic cousins, they also acquired the skills of siegecraft so well they were rarely thwarted in their attempts to capture cities. We will have much to say about these political, social and military innovations in the lectures that follow. Let me offer you a brief timeline of the events we unfold in this course, which focuses on a period of just over 300 years from the late 12th to the early 16th centuries. The man who became Chinggis Khan was born probably in the year 1162 as Temujin, the son of a minor Mongol chief. Over the next four decades, he made many allies and just as many enemies as he slowly clawed his way to the top of the Mongol world. Until in 1206, at the age of 44, he was proclaimed Chinggis Khan, the universal ruler, the strong ruler. For the next five years, Chinggis consolidated, consolidated his position by bringing various Turkic tribes into his coalition and also by waging war against the Sisya tribes that control parts of Western China and Tibet. Then, in 1211, Chinggis launched his first assault on northern China, which was under the control of the Jin dynasty. Eventually capturing its northern capital of Zhongdu, Chinggis then tried to establish friendly commercial relations with the Shah of Khwarezmia to the west, a huge Islamic state that stretched from the western edge of China to Persia. But the Shah treated Chinggis' envoy so shamefully that Chinggis had no option other than to declare war. After concluding this brutal masterpiece of warfare, Chinggis died at, in 1227 at the age of 65 in the midst of yet another campaign, this time against the Sisya in Western China. Chinggis' successor as Khan was his third son, Ogadai, who was elected in 1229. Ogadai inherited an empire some 9 million square miles in area, already four times the size of the Roman Empire. But this was by no means the end of Mongol expansion. Under Ogadai, the war in northern China was resumed and successfully concluded with the collapse of the Jin. Korea was also conquered, and far to the west, Mongol armies invaded Armenia, Georgia, and Russia before destroying the flower of European knighthood in major battles in Poland and Hungary. There is every reason to believe that Western Europe was only saved from Mongol devastation by the death of Khan Ogadai in 1241. The decade between 1241 and 1251 gave Eurasia breathing space as disagreements over succession led to an eruption of internal disputes between the families of Chinggis's four sons. This had the effect of turning the attention of Mongol elites inwards and away from further expansion. But that ended in 1251 with the succession of Khan Monkey, the son of Chinggis's youngest son, Tolui. Upon coming to power, Monkey staged a Toluid revolution that destroyed the power of rival lineages. 
He then dispatched his brothers Kublai and Hulagu on new campaigns of conquest to China and the Middle East, respectively. Kublai was intent upon destroying the Southern Song Dynasty, while Hulagu's capture of Baghdad in 1258 brought to an end the Golden Age of Islam. By the mid-13th century, tensions were running so high amongst the Chinggisids that there was no longer any possibility of reunifying the Mongol Empire, which now devolved into four autonomous Khanates. The Yuan Dynasty ruled China and East Asia, the Chagatayid Ulus controlled Central Asia, the Ilkhanate ruled in Persia and the Middle East, and the Golden Horde controlled the steppes of Southern Russia. Monkey's death in 1259 led to civil war between various factions, which further entrenched the divisions between the Khanates. Kublai was eventually elected Great Khan in 1260, but his position was by no means universally accepted. Kublai finally completed the conquest of China in 1274, 63 years after Chinggis Khan had launched his initial assault on the Jin Dynasty way back in 1211. For the remainder of his life, Kublai worked to expand his domain throughout much of East Asia, although his invasions of Japan and Vietnam both failed. Kublai died in 1294 as nominal ruler of something like one-sixth of the land surface of the earth. But such a massive empire, riven with so many factions and internal disputes, could never last, and so gradually the Mongol Khanates fell apart. The Ilkhanate in Persia collapsed in 1335, and the Yuan Dynasty was eventually destroyed by the Chinese Ming Dynasty in 1368. The Chagatai Ulus in Central Asia suffered a much more gradual disintegration and eventually morphed into the heartland of the Timurid Empire, while the Golden Horde in Russia maintained some degree of power and prestige in the region for almost another four centuries. The final part of our course is focused on the conqueror Timur and his successors. Timur, who is of Turkic Mongol heritage, was born in modern Uzbekistan, probably in the 1320s, and like his hero Chinggis Khan, he gradually rose to power through diplomacy and inter-tribal warfare. Timur was badly wounded in a battle in the 1360s and acquired a limp for the rest of his life, hence the name by which he is better known in the West, Timur the Lame or Tamerlane. Timur was the last great nomadic conqueror in world history, and in a series of major campaigns all over Eurasia, he created his own enormous empire. After his death in 1405, his sons and grandsons ruled the remnants of empire through to the early 16th century, with one descendant, Babur, creating the Mughal Empire in India that would rule there until the British turned up in the 18th century. This then is the epic tale we unfold in this course, frankly one of the most extraordinary stories in the long annals of world history. In the next two lectures, we'll explore the environmental context in which the lifeway of militarized nomadism emerged and the formidable steppe predecessors to the Mongols, beginning with the mighty Xiongnu. But in what remains of this first lecture, I thought it might be helpful to try and paint a, a picture of the larger geopolitical context for the emergence of the Mongols, by outlining some of the key developments in Eurasian history over the centuries leading up to the birth of Chinggis Khan. Practitioners in the fields of world history and big history, amongst whom I include myself, believe that individual stories, even ones as epic as the Mongols, make so much more sense when situated in both the environmental and geopolitical context in which they play out. So let's pick up the story of Eurasian history back in the third century of the Common Era, at a moment when all the imperial states of Afro-Eurasia were facing serious problems. In China, the Han Dynasty collapsed in 220 after decades of poor leadership and internal division. For the next 350 years, China was divided into a variety of kingdoms and small dynasties, with warlords vying for power with nomadic invaders. Late in the sixth century, the Buddhist Sui Dynasty ended this age of disunity, restoring strong central government and building impressive infrastructure works like the Grand Canal. But these put such a strain on conscripted peasant labor that the Sui dynasty collapsed quickly early in the 7th century. Their successors, the Tang dynasty, ruled for the next three centuries until 907 of the Common Era, turning China into what was undoubtedly the wealthiest and most powerful civilization on the planet. 
Under the Tang, China became a major imperial power again, incorporating Manchuria, Vietnam, much of Tibet, and large regions of Central Asia into the Tang Empire. Farming became more efficient, and China's population approached 100 million. By the 10th century, Tang China was the most urbanized society on the planet, with the capital, Chang'an, home to two million residents. Innovation and commerce flourished in the workshops of the, the many great Tang cities, including in porcelain, iron and steel, silk, gunpowder and printing. The Silk Roads were revived and foreign merchants established such a presence in Tang cities that virtually every religion of Afro-Eurasia was practiced somewhere in the country. The Tang collapsed early in the 10th century and this led to another period of fragmentation, but this lasted for only 50 years before the Song Dynasty restored order. However, the Song were forced to deal with powerful and restive militarized nomads on their northern border, and eventually the northern half of China was overrun by the Jurchen, who established their own Chinese-style Jin dynasty. South of an uneasy border, more or less midway between the Huanghe, the Yellow River, and the Yangtze River, the Southern Song ruled a dynamic commercial state from their capital of Linan, the modern city of Hangzhou. This was the geopolitical situation in East Asia that the Mongols faced when Chinggis Khan launched his initial raids on Jin China in 1211. In Central Asia, meanwhile, the Parthian and Kushan empires were both overrun by the Sasanians at exactly the same time that the Han Dynasty was collapsing in China. The Sasanians went on to create their own impressive empire that lasted for more than 400 years. At its peak, the Sasanian empire stretched from Afghanistan to the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, which led to conflict with the Romans. The founder of the Sasanian state, Ardashir I, was a brilliant military leader who fought the Roman emperor Alexander Severus for control of Mesopotamia, and the Euphrates River became a, a sort of fortified border between the two empires. The second Sasanian ruler, Shapur I, triumphed over three successive Roman emperors, defeating one, killing the next, and capturing the third. The Silk Roads remained a major land trade route during the Sasanian era, although maritime routes became more important because these incessant wars between the Sasanians and the Romans disrupted land-based trade. The Sasanians maintained successful commercial relationships with the Tang Chinese and with the Byzantines. And between them, these three imperial powers controlled much of Eurasia from the Yellow Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. In the mid-7th century, however, this Eurasian system was upturned by the appearance of another new power, the Muslims, who destroyed the Sasanians and ushered in a brand new chapter in the history of Afro-Eurasia. From the 8th century through to the arrival of the Mongols in the early 13th century, the histories of many of the states and cultures of inner Eurasia became interconnected by the expansion of Islam. Created by Muslim warriors, merchants, missionaries, and administrators, the vast Dar al-Islam, the abode or the realm of Islam, became one of the most important economic, intellectual, and cultural structures in the world, dominating the western half of Afro-Eurasia in the same way that the Tang Dynasty dominated the eastern. The lightning-fast expansion of the Dar al-Islam was unprecedented. By 637, just five years after Muhammad's death, much of Syria, Palestine, and all of Mesopotamia had become part of the Muslim world. In the 640s, much of North Africa was incorporated. And by the time the Sasanian Empire fell to the Muslims in 651, the Dar al-Islam already stretched from the Mediterranean to Afghanistan. After a period of political consolidation, Islamic armies resumed the jihad early in the 8th century. Parts of northern India were conquered in 711, and Muslim hegemony in North Africa was extended to Morocco and then across the Strait of Gibraltar and into Spain by 718. In less than a century, the Islamic realm had expanded to become the largest civilization the world had ever seen. Early Muslim rulers established an administrative structure known as a caliphate that achieved stability under the Umayyad dynasty, which ruled from 661 to 750. The Umayyads were wealthy Meccan merchants who ruled the caliphate from the Syrian commercial city of Damascus. Initially, the uh, Umayyads provided capable administrators, but during the 8th century, they became increasingly aloof and they were overthrown by the Abbasids in 750. The Abbasid dynasty then ruled the Islamic world from their purpose-built capital of Baghdad until it 
and they were destroyed by the Mongols in 1258. The Abbasids learned from the cultural exclusivity of the Umayyads and instituted a more cosmopolitan form of government in which power and administrative responsibilities were shared more equitably amongst Arabs, Persians, Egyptians and Mesopotamians. With a steady flow of tributary revenue coming in from all over the Islamic world, Baghdad was beautified with magnificent buildings, mosques and squares and became one of the great commercial, financial, industrial and intellectual cities of the world. Under the Abbasids, millions converted to Islam and enriched the Islamic realm by bringing into it their own cultural traditions. This cultural and linguistic synthesis resulted in a, an explosion of intellectual activity throughout the Muslim world in a period historian Frederick Starr has called the Lost Enlightenment. With all of Central Asia and the Middle East now under the control of the Muslims, regions that for centuries had been divided amongst different political powers, an economic golden age also ensued. Under the Abbasids, agriculture thrived in Egypt, Syria and Mesopotamia during a period sometimes called the medieval Green Revolution. It was an era of increased productivity and population growth that stimulated the economy of the region like never before. Increased agricultural output was achieved by the expansion and better maintenance of the ancient irrigation canal systems, some of which had been in place in Mesopotamia for 4,000 years by this stage and also by the introduction of new methods of fertilization and crop rotation. Commercial activity also flourished across the Islamic world. Remember, Muhammad himself had been a merchant, and under the Abbasids, elaborate trade networks linked all the regions of the Dar al-Islam together, connecting them to an even larger Afro-Eurasian-wide network. Camel caravans facilitated this, leading to the construction of thousands of new caravan sarais, and of course, maritime trade became even more prosperous after Islamic sailors adopted Chinese innovations like the compass. Muslim sailors and their ships linked East and Southeast Asia to the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, and the coast of East Africa in a thriving commercial network. It was inevitable that the expansive worlds of Islam and Tang China would eventually need to confront each other. The Tang had reached deep into Central Asia in constructing its massive tributary empire, just as the realm of Islam was expanding into the same region from the opposite direction. An important battle was fought in 751 between Islamic and Tang Chinese forces deep in the heart of Central Asia. During the five-day Battle of Talas, a large Muslim force initially struggled to overcome a smaller Chinese army for control of the important Siadaya Valley. The Chinese forces were eventually overwhelmed, marking the end of westward Tang expansion and opening up much of Central Asia to Muslim penetration leading to the further spread of Islam amongst the Turkic peoples living in the region. Legend has it that amongst the Chinese captives were two papermakers, and this is how the craft of papermaking was introduced into the Islamic world. Over the centuries that followed, Abbasid control of the caliphate became increasingly compromised as more and more regional Islamic states claimed autonomy and even stopped paying their taxes to Baghdad. New regional powers like the Tahirids and the Samanids effectively ended any semblance of a, an all-powerful caliph in Baghdad. In the 10th century, Persian aristocrats took over the Abbasid throne, and during the following century, power passed into the hands of the Seljuks, a group of militarized Turks who had converted to Islam and now occupied much of the caliphate. We'll talk more about the expansion of the Turks in a later lecture. But even though the Abbasid Caliphate was fragmenting, we need to acknowledge that for about 700 years before the Mongols appeared, Muslim administrators maintained a connected zone of trade, exchange and communication that stretched from India and Central Asia all the way to the Pyrenees. Intellectual activity flourished and new crops, agricultural technologies and manufactured goods were spread by merchants across an enormous region of Afro-Eurasia, stimulating that world zone as never before. Any hope that this golden age of Islam could be maintained was destroyed in the 13th century by the Mongols, as we shall see. Finally, let's consider the situation in Europe following the disintegration of the Roman Empire. During the 5th century, the Western Roman Empire fragmented into a series of fortified estates and competitive regional kingdoms. But the eastern half remained unified and strong as the Byzantine Empire, which lasted for another thousand years. 
Constantinople withstood sieges by Islamic armies in the 7th and 8th centuries, although large regions of the empire were lost to the Muslims. The core empire survived, however, and used its strategic position to remain unconquered and wealthy through trade and innovative manufacturing until 1453, when Constantinople was finally sacked by the Ottoman Turks. Further west, regions of the former Roman Empire gradually lost the ability to collect taxes or maintain a professional army. This led to political fragmentation and a new balance of power between monarchs, wealthy landholders, and the Christian church, which now began to play an increasingly important role in medieval Western Europe. The collapse of the Roman taxation and administration system made it difficult to maintain many of the Roman cities of the West. Some disappeared completely, while others broke up into areas of smaller settlements, uh, separated by ruins and spaces converted into market gardens and vineyards. The Franks were the first in a series of Germanic-speaking dynasties to establish successful states in Western Europe. Under King Clovis, who reigned from 481 to 511 and who converted to Christianity, rival Frankish subgroups were consolidated under a strong monarchy that took control of much of Gaul as far as the Rhine River. Renewed Frankish expansion commenced late in the 7th century under a new family of Carolingian leaders, including Pepin II and his son, Charles Martel, who stopped the Muslim invasion of Europe at Poitiers in 732 of the Common Era. The Frankish kingdom reached its height under Charlemagne, whose imperial state included all of modern France, parts of northern Spain, the territory between the Rhine and the Elba, northern Italy, and much of the middle Danube basin. Yet Charlemagne's empire was fleeting, and by the late 9th century, power had reverted to a, a series of local princes who lived in rural palaces in the heartlands of their kingdoms, where their own lands and followers were concentrated. In Italy, the Germanic Lombards lived in cities like Milan and Venice, which by the 9th century had already developed into a major commercial port. Rome remained the largest city in the West with a population of perhaps 25,000 in the 8th century. In Spain, the destruction of the Visigothic kingdom by the Muslims in 711 led to wholesale economic collapse, although by the end of the 8th century, the unification of the territory that became known as Al-Andalus under the Arab Umayyad Emirate led to a gradual recovery. In Britain, many centuries of Roman occupation had increased the prosperity of a small class of villa owners. But by the mid-5th century, the breakdown of Roman control exposed these Romano-British to regular raids by Picts and Scots and by Anglo-Saxons from the mainland. By the early 7th century, 10 or more small Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had been established in England. Further north, trading and raiding in the later 8th and early 9th centuries brought Scandinavian peoples into close contact with communities in both Western Europe and Russia. Political instability in Denmark resulted in expeditions by armed bands of Vikings out of Scandinavia in the mid-9th century and to their raiding and eventual settlement in Britain, France and Russia. Wealthy monasteries were particularly subject to Viking attacks, both on the coast and in the interior, as the raiders used rivers to move inland. Vikings looted Paris in 845 and in the decades that followed, conquered Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Britain. In 878, King Alfred of Wessex defeated Viking forces at the Battle of Eddington, after which the Danish King Guthrum accepted baptism, and the Scandinavian presence in England was officially recognised as the Dane law. In France, the land around the city of Rouen was granted in the year 911 to a Viking leader named Rollo, land that eventually evolved into the Duchy of Normandy. Scandinavian peoples also played a critical role in the emergence of the first Russian state. Vikings established commercial bases in Ukraine and Russia and took control of regional exchange networks, establishing themselves as the new elite that would evolve into rulers of the first Russian state, Kievan Rus. The development of Russia was tied to the emergence of another group destined to play an important role in the future history of both Europe and Russia, the Slavs, who eventually occupied a wide region stretching from the Balkans to Russia, setting up a contest for their conversion between the Pope in Rome and the Patriarch in Constantinople. By the mid-12th century then, huge civilizations controlled substantial regions of Eurasia, including the Song and Jin dynasties in East Asia, the Abbasid Caliphate and its regional affiliates 
in Central and West Asia and the Byzantines in the Balkans. But in Russia and Western Europe, a series of small city-states and kingdoms had emerged that traded and fought vigorously with each other. With the exception of the Jin and the Song, few of these great powers would have even been aware of the quiet steppe grasslands of Mongolia, nor of the Mongols, who were just one of several pastoral nomadic tribes that resided there. But that was all about to change with the birth of an infant named Temujin in the year 1162, an infant born clutching a clot of blood in his tiny hand, a sure sign of destined greatness.